Come in, come in. Hi, nice to see you. Come and have a seat. Put that close the door behind you. Oh well. We make our way a bit more into the new year. I did tidy this room and now yet the, the sort of island of books and reviews and things I'm reading just circles me again. I have to sort of tread over books to uh, to get to my chair. But one of the books I have out is, as you know, a favourite. Um, in fact, it's my favourite of all the Narnia books. It's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which have in this very nice reissue that came out as they were originally hardback with the wonderful Pauline Baines illustrations. I loved this book and read it so many times. You'll see it's full of paper and marks and that's because a while back I gave a talk on the Voyage of the Dawn Treader for a, a Romanian C.S. Lewis Society about it as a sort of account of spiritual life really. Anyway, which is what Lewis said it was. Um, I have it out again today because uh, of another C.S. Lewis Society, not the Romanian one, but the older one of the one of the various C.S. Lewis Society, a thing called the C.S. Lewis Foundation, which I've given talks for and done things with over the years. It's been a wonderful organisation, and it was started really by the vision of a a man called Stan Matson, whom I was very glad to get to know and who was the first person that ever thought it worthwhile to bring me across the Atlantic to speak in America. And he was, uh, he was a great man. I say was because I've just had the news uh, a week or two ago that he died. I mean, he, you know, he was, uh, in his, he was an old man, so... But he had done extraordinary things with his life. Anyway, lots of people were, of course, saying how he had, was quite a big man with a hair and a beard, so he, lots of people were trying to say how leonine he was. Well, but somebody who worked closely with him at the foundation said, in some ways, he was more like the character Reaper Cheap. Um, you know, courteous, daring, but with a single-minded desire to do the thing that he thought he was given to do, which in Reaper Cheap's case is sailing east to find Aslan's country. And uh, so somebody said, you know, that, that when he died, they thought about the last bit, the Reaper Cheap going off in his coracle um, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And, you know, I'd never thought of that as a beautiful spiritual account of a of a good, a good Christian death, as it were, and the adventure of it. So I thought, I'm going to reread it just to see. And I've just done that. And it really is moving. I mean, it was moving anyway. I loved it anyway. It's one of the great passages of Lewis's prose. But um, I read it in that context, of thinking about how any of us might leave this world and go to Aslan's country. And then I found it more moving than ever. So I thought I'd just share it with you. Of course, you know the story. They've been sailing. They've, they've achieved the quest, which is to find the, the seven lost lords of Narnia and account for them and bring them to Aslan's table. Now they're saying to the utter east, as it were, literally to the very edge of the world. And um, uh, the children have been told to do that because, as we know, in fact, they're going to meet, meet Aslan. But, but for this is for Reaper Cheap, really the fulfilment of his deepest, deepest longings. Let me pick up the tale. They're on a little boat. They've left the Dawn Treader itself behind. There was no need to row, for the current drifted them steadily to the east. None of them slept or ate. All that night and all next day they glided eastward, and when the third day dawned, with a brightness you or I could not bear even if we had dark glasses on, they saw a wonder ahead. It was as if a wall stood up between them and the sky, a greenish Grey, trembling, shimmering wall. 
Then up came the sun, and its first, at its first rising they saw, saw it through the wall, and it turned into wonderful rainbow colours. Then they knew that the wall was really a long, tall wave, a wave endlessly fixed in one place, as you may often see at the edge of a waterfall. It seemed to be about thirty feet high, and the current was gliding them swiftly towards it. You might have supposed that they would have thought of their danger. They didn't. I don't think anyone could have in their position. For now, they saw something not only behind the wave, but behind the sun. They could not have seen the sun if their eyes had not been strengthened by the water of the last sea. But now they could look at the rising sun and see it clearly and see things beyond it. What they saw eastward beyond the sun was a range of mountains. It was so high that either they never saw the top of it or they forgot it. None of them remembers seeing any sky in that direction. And the mountains must really have been outside the world. For any mountains, even a quarter of the twentieth of that height ought to have had ice and snow on them. But these were warm and green and full of forests and waterfalls, however high you looked. And suddenly there came a breeze from the east, tossing the top of the wave into foamy shapes and ruffling the smooth water all around them. It lasted only a second or so, but what it brought them in that second none of those three children will ever forget. It brought both a smell and a sound, a musical sound. Edmund and Eustace would never talk about it afterwards. Lucy could only say, it would break your heart. Why, said I, was it so sad? Sad, no, said Lucy. No one in that boat doubted that they were seeing beyond the end of the world into Aslan's country. At that moment, with a crunch, the boat ran aground. The water was too shallow for it now. This, said Reaper Cheap, is where I go on alone. They did not even try to stop him, for everything now felt as if it had been fated or had happened before. They helped him to lower his little coracle. Then he took off his sword. I shall need it no more, he said. That's a huge moment, because his sword is the very emblem of him. He's a martial mouth, so that laying aside of the last weapon is wonderful. I shall need it no more, he said, and flung it far away across the lilied sea. Where it fell, it stood upright with the hilt above the surface. Then he bade them goodbye, trying to be sad for their sakes. But he was quivering with happiness. Lucy, for the first and last time, did what she had always wanted to do, taking him in her arms and caressing him. Then hastily he got into his coracle and took his paddle, and the current caught it, and away he went, very black against the lilies. But no lilies grew on the wave. It was a smooth green slope. The oracle went more and more, the coracle went more and more quickly, and beautifully it rushed up the wave's side. For one splint second they saw its shape and reaper cheap at the very top. Then it vanished. And since that moment, no one can truly claim to have seen reaper cheap the mouse. But my belief is that he came safe to Aslan's country and is alive there to this day. Uh, it's just uh, really masterful writing. The idea of behind or beyond the sun, that makes me think of that Maysfield line, out beyond the sunset, uh, could I but find the way. And um, uh, it's lovely, the laying aside of the sword, the last embrace, trying to be sad for the others, but quivering with excitement. I think that would be a great way for anyone who knew that the end of this world, the end of the end of this world, come for anybody to leave this world in that spirit, uh, would be absolutely wonderful. So, um, I think with thanksgiving for the life of Stan Matz, and of course I thank God for having given us a a writer like Lewis to write gorgeous and moving prose like that. Thanks for dropping round.